What's going on guys, it's Simo, and welcome back to my new mini-series where we traverse the history of the Yu-Gi-Oh! ban list. If you missed the first episode, I'd highly recommend checking it out, but if you thought those cards were broken, oh man, we're going through a whole new set today, and these cards might even be worse than the previous, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Eclipse Wyvern is a light level 4 dragon effect monster with 1600 attack and 1000 defense. If this card is sent to the graveyard, banish one level 7 or higher light or dark dragon type monster from your deck. If this card is banished from your graveyard, you can add the monster banished by this card's effect to your hand. Note that Eclipse Wyvern does not have a once per turn restriction on either of its effects, making it highly abusable. Thanks to the baby Chaos Dragons, White Dragon Wyvern Burster, and Black Dragon Collapse Serpent, triggering Eclipse Wyvern is incredibly reliable, especially while the baby Chaos Dragons were unlimited. Eclipse Wyvern can easily be tutored with Guard Dragon LP and then shortly recovered with Guard Dragon Pisty after being used for other combo plays, providing the dragon player with an absurd amount of advantage. Chaos Emperor, the dragon of Armageddon, could be sent off of Wyvern, then added to hand once the Wyvern was banished, then Emperor could pay to get the banished Wyvern back to hand and fetch other powerful high-level dragons such as Chaos Dragon Levineer, which could also trigger Wyvern if necessary. You know, older Yu-Gi-Oh players may remember Light Pulsar Dragon or Dark Flare Dragon as the faces of Chaos Dragons, but New Age Yu-Gi-Oh has far and away eclipsed eclipsed the power level of that deck, and that's ultimately why Eclipse Wyvern had to go. Fairy Tail Snow is a light level 4 spellcaster effect monster with 1850 attack and 1000 defense. If this card is normal or special summoned, you can target one face up monster your opponent controls, change it to face down defense position. Book of Moon is arguably one of the most versatile spells in Yu-Gi-Oh, so having this effect built into a monster provides a tremendous amount of utility. Additionally, if Snow is in your graveyard, as a quick effect, you can banish seven other cards from either your hand, field, and or graveyard to special summon this card. Decks that can easily load up the graveyard such as Light Sworn or Infernoid were primed to abuse a card like Snow, especially when a card like That Grass Looks Greener was still legal. Similar to most banned cards, Snow can even be used multiple times per turn, providing multiple forms of disruption during the opponent's turn and shutting down effect monsters with ignition effects, synchro summons, exceed summons, and link summons in the process. Now, while link monsters specifically can't be set face down, non-link monsters can, potentially stopping a big push, and the overall ubiquity of their material requirements made it even easier to have Snow hit the graveyard in preparation for her revival effect, further increasing its potency. As soon as Snow hit the graveyard, the entire dynamic of the game changed. Players constantly had to check the graveyard to see how many times a player could activate Snow in the same turn and have to worry about whether or not that was going to stop them from making their push, and a lot of the times it did, and and so players were relieved when Snow finally hit the ban list. Fiber Jar is an Earth level 3 plant effect monster with 500 attack and defense. It's a flip effect monster that reads each player shuffles all cards from their hand, field, and graveyard into the deck, then draws five cards. An incredibly simple yet powerful effect, Fiber Jar was most effective as a comeback mechanic when the game wasn't exactly going your way. During the reign of the original unerratted Chaos Emperor Dragon, this was one of the few cards that could potentially give you a fighting chance by allowing you to draw a fresh hand. Similar to Cyber Jar in the previous episode of this series, many people feel that Fiber Jar could be unbanned since it's tremendously slow considering it's a flip effect monster and players are armed with tons of removal to dispatch a monster before it can potentially be flipped face up. However, unlike Cyber Jar, Fiber Jar resets almost everything, even putting itself back into the deck, creating situations where the game can constantly be reset over and over again again, as long as players continue finding Fiber Jar. Fiber Jar just has such a unique design, and again, this card just screams Yu-Gi-Oh to me. There's very few cards in not just Yu-Gi-Oh, but any card game that will reset the game almost entirely. And yes, as the game has aged, we've introduced the Banish Zone, we've introduced the Pendulum Zone, so it doesn't reset everything, nor does it reset players' life points, but it's been a fixture of the ban list since about 2005, and I imagine it's going to stay there probably until the end of time. Fishboard Blaster is a water level 1 fish tuner effect monster with 100 attack and 200 defense. If you control a face up level 3 or lower water monster, you can discard one card, special summon this card from your graveyard. If this card is used as a synchro material monster, all other synchro material monsters must be water. We've already gone into great detail in this series about the power that tuner monsters bring to the game, but Fishboard Blaster in particular is an infinitely reusable tuner since there isn't a once per turn clause anywhere on the card, and enables 
broken synchro plays with cards like Formula Synchron and TG Hyper Librarian to draw tons of cards and allow you to constantly keep reviving it from the graveyard. In tandem with a card like Super Ancient Deep Sea King Coelacanth, you could synchro into massive boards resulting in the infamous Fish OTK. Now there are multiple variants of the Fish OTK, but one of them and probably the most popular involves Colossal Fighter and Armory Arm. Using Super Ancient Deep Sea King Coelacanth, it's incredibly easy to synchro into both Colossal Fighter and Armory Arm, and if your opponent controls a monster in attack position, you can equip the Armory Arm to their monster, increasing its attack points by a thousand, ideally above that of the Colossal Fighter. The idea here is to make the opponent's monster have more attack power, because then the Armory Arm has a second effect where it burns your opponent equal to the monster's attack points that the equipped monster has destroyed in battle. So when you proceed to the battle phase and crash your Colossal Fighter into your opponent's monster that's equipped with your Armory Arm, your opponent will take 2800 damage and the Colossal Fighter will then revive itself from its own effect. At that point, all you have to do is repeat the process two more times and win the game because that totals 8400 damage. And even if the opponent's monster only has a thousand attack, you can make two Armory Arms instead of just one and perform the same OTK. Fishborg Blaster has enabled some of the craziest combos in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, and by modern Yu-Gi-Oh standards, it would probably be even more broken if it were still legal today. Continuing on with broken tuner monsters, Glow Up Bulb is an Earth level 1 plant tuner effect monster with 100 attack and defense. If this card is in your graveyard, you can send the top card of your deck to the graveyard, and if you do, special summon this card. You can only use this effect of Glow Up Bulb once per duel. Glow Up Bulb shares a lot of similarities with Blackwing Steam the Cloak, which we discussed in the previous episode, allowing it to work as a material for two separate Synchro Xyz or Link Summons as desired. The supposed drawback of Glow Up Bulb is supposed to be milling the top card of your deck, but that's usually a boon in a lot of instances, allowing you to extend your plays even further if you hit the right cards. It may also sound like a broken record, but it's also a one card Christron Halky Fibrax since it's a tuner, which we've already learned is a huge power play. And with so many ways to send Glow Up Bulb to the graveyard, the card has only gotten stronger over time. Glow Up Bulb is probably considered to be in like the top 10 or top five best tuner monsters of all time. So it's really no surprise that it eventually made its way onto the ban list. Grinder Golem is a dark level eight fiend effect monster with 3000 attack and 300 defense. It cannot be normal summoned or set, must first be special summoned from your hand to your opponent's side of the field by special summoning two grinder tokens, which are fiend type dark level one zero attack and defense tokens in face up attack position on your side of the field. If you special summon this monster, you cannot normal summon or set a monster during the same turn. While Grinder Golem was released all the way back in 2008, it didn't truly start seeing play until the introduction of Link Monsters and the emphasis on monster placement, which was much more prominent. Continuing the trend, Grinder Golem's effect is not once per turn, making it a powerful asset to Link spamming decks due to its token production. After summoning Grinder Golem to the opponent's field, you could use the Grinder tokens to Link summon into requirements to make a Kashyyyk Magician and use her effect to bounce the Grinder Golem back to your hand. Since Grinder Golem isn't once per turn, you could special summon the Grinder Golem again to your opponent's field, generate yourself two more tokens, allowing you to Link Climb into a Link 4 such as Firewall Dragon. Security Dragon was another Link monster that helped bounce Grinder Golem for even further plays, but this card was released rather late in the TCG and didn't see as much play compared to the OCG. But that didn't stop players from abusing Grinder Golem as much as humanly possible until the card was eventually banned. Jet Synchron is a fire level one machine tuner effect monster with 500 attack and zero defense. The most relevant part of Jet Synchron's text reads, you can send one card from your hand to the graveyard, special summon this card, but banish it when it leaves the field. You can only use one Jet Synchron effect per turn and only once that turn. Jet Synchron shares a lot of similarities with the previously discussed Glow Up Bowl being a level one tuner that can be used multiple times for different types of summons. One big difference, however, is that Jet Synchron requires you to have a card in hand to send to the graveyard, which is worse than Glow Up Bowl, but the advantage is you know exactly what card you're sending, which can allow for further follow-up plays more reliably. Jet Synchron really took off in the Synchro Eldritch deck, where a single copy of Jet Synchron would end on a board of multiple negations and make it incredibly difficult for the opponent to play the game. But Jet Synchron has always been used as a strong tuner in multiple Synchro-focused decks, it just became a victim of a rapidly evolving modern Yu-Gi-Oh format. Continuing the trend of broken level 1 monsters, Level Eater is a dark level 1 insect effect monster with 600 attack and 0 defense. If this card is in your graveyard, you can target 
one level five or higher monster you control, reduce its level by one, and if you do, special summon this card. This face-up card on the field cannot be tributed except for a tribute summon. That last part of the text seldom mattered because even though you can't use it for tribute summons, you can still use it for synchro summons, exceed summons, and most notably, link summons. Similarly to Fishboard Blaster, Level Eater can revive itself any number of times per turn so long as you have a level five or higher monster on the field that Level Eater can eat the level of to constantly bring itself back. While Level Eater was always a popular tool in synchro decks, it didn't gain its notoriety until the advent of dark synchro decks when more tuner synchro monsters abuse this card for combos that can banish the opponent's entire hand in one turn with cards such as Cyframe Lord Omega and Trishula Dragon of the Ice Barrier. By modern Yu-Gi-Oh standards, Level Eater acts as a near infinite source of link material as long as you kept high level monsters on the field to enable Level Eater to constantly special summon itself back to the field. Let's just say it didn't take Konami long to realize how broken Level Eater was in a format with link summons, so the card was quickly banned and let's be honest will probably stay banned for all of eternity. Luna Light Tiger is a light level 3 Beast Warrior Pendulum effect monster with 1200 attack, 800 defense, and a pendulum scale of 5. Its pendulum effect reads, once per turn you can target one Luna Light monster in your graveyard, special summon it, but it cannot attack, its effects are negated, also it is destroyed during the end phase. While this effect of Luna Light Tiger does have a once per turn clause, it's a soft once per turn clause, meaning that if a new copy of the card is played, or let's say the same copy of the card is added back to hand, then replayed, then the effect of this card can be activated once more. In combination with cards such as Luna Light Yellow Martin and Blackwing Zephyros the Elite, Luna Light Tiger's Pendulum effect could be used three times in a turn, resurrecting numerous monsters to build increasingly more powerful boards. While this effect made it so that the revived monsters could not attack or activate their effects, it didn't matter when most of the time you could use these monsters as material for either Link Summons or Xyz Summons and just help produce bigger and bigger boards. Luna Light Tiger also has a monster effect which reads, if this card on the field is destroyed by battle or card effect, you can target a Luna Light monster in your graveyard, special summon it, you can only use this effect of Luna Light Tiger once per turn. It's actually really funny how this effect has a hard once per turn clause, but the stronger of the two effects does not. Luna Light Tiger was instrumental in allowing Luna Light to dominate the competitive landscape for several months. Prior to that, it was just a rogue deck, but after constant refinement, people realized that it was actually a very solid tier one contender, because not only Luna Light Tiger was abusable, a lot of the archetype was riddled with soft once per turn effects. Unfortunately, it didn't take Konami long to notice this, and they promptly banned Luna Light Tiger as a result, which brought a lot of tears to people's eyes, but at the same time, it was also justified. Oh boy, Magical Scientist is a dark level one spellcaster effect monster with 300 attack and defense. Its effect reads, pay 1000 life points to special summon one level six or lower fusion monster from your extra deck in face up attack or defense position. That fusion monster cannot attack your opponent's life points directly and is returned to your extra deck at the end of the turn. Magical Scientist might be one of the first truly broken cards in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. It was responsible for the dreaded Magical Scientist FTK. In tandem with Catapult Turtle, you could pay 7,000 life points to summon seven different fusion monsters with 2,100 attack, tribute them to the Catapult Turtle, then finally tribute off the scientist and the turtle to itself to deal exactly 8,000 damage to your opponent before they even had the chance to play a single card. And keep in mind, this was before hand traps existed, so if your opponent got to the combo, there was very little, if anything, you could do. Even if you ignore the FDK, Magical Scientist allowed you to toolbox the entire fusion deck at will to fit any situation. Needed to deal with flip effect monsters? Summon Fiend Skull Dragon. What about normal traps? How about Ryu Senshi? Need to out a Jinzo? Summon Thousand Eyes Restrict. It seemed that no matter what the situation, Magical Scientist had a clean answer with whatever you were faced with. Even in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, Magical Scientist would be absolutely batshit insane. By himself, Magical Scientist could potentially generate eight different monsters worth of material for either different synchro summons, exceed summons, and link summons. And sure, there are plenty of cards nowadays to check the power of Magical Scientist, such as hand traps and other forms of effect negation, but that doesn't take away from how ludicrously devastating the card can be if it's able to go off. As broken as Magical Scientist is, I actually really love the design of this card. It was rather unique in that it allowed you to toolbox the extra deck in a way that really wasn't ever done before and was almost a premonition for how modern Yu-Gi-Oh would play out. Think about how
how now we use the extra deck as an extension of our main deck and equip it with plenty of tools to almost deal with any situation put in front of us, and Magical Scientist was doing this all the way back in 2003. Now the card is crazy, right? It's broken, it's bonkers, there's like 500 different adjectives I could use to describe just how good of a card Magical Scientist is, and let's be honest, it 100% deserves to be banned. But Magical Scientist is one of the few cards that really only Yu-Gi-Oh could get away with as a card game, and it's what makes Yu-Gi-Oh Yu-Gi-Oh to a lot of people. You know, this is memories for a lot of people, and I feel like it's one of those cards that's cemented itself in Yu-Gi-Oh's history that maybe, just like me, this was one of the first decks you encountered when you went to locals as an 11-year-old, and it permanently scarred you for life. And at the same time, that's also a card that maybe fueled you to want to learn more about the game and discover some of the absolutely amazing things that you could actually do with this game if you're able to break open the mold of what's possible within the system itself. To me personally, playing games is all about experiencing emotion, and to those old school players like myself, when we see images of magical scientists, that will evoke the same level of emotion as a lot of nostalgic players seeing pictures of cards like Dark Magician and Blue Eyes White Dragon, but just for a different reason. But we all have those memories, and it's interesting that a lot of those memories are actually cemented onto the ban list for one reason or another, and I'm curious to know what that is for you guys. Let me know down in the comments what moment it is for you that you have imprinted into your memory when it comes to the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game. I know we all have those moments, and I think it'd be cool to share those with everyone else because we all experience it in different ways, and that's some of the best part about this game, sharing in those memories with other players who appreciate them as well. So guys, that's going to wrap it up for the second episode of Traversing the History of the Yu-Gi-Oh! Ban List. Be sure to let me know down in the comments what you think as well. Thank you so much for watching the video. Be sure to like the video as always. Subscribe to the channel for more amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! content. And if you found this video informative, consider supporting me on Patreon for exclusive early one-day access to both the Yu-Gi-Oh! Progression series and the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! Thank you all so much again for watching, and we will see you next time.